All right, am I sharing the right screen? You got it. All right, perfect. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Donnie Page. I'm a solutions engineer at, at HashiCorp here. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending uh, the session on zero trust security. Um, this is, we are gonna do a vault exercise, but you know, part of zero trust, there's gonna be a few more products in here that we're gonna discuss. Um, and basically I'm gonna go over our views on security and how we solution um, zero trust. So if you're not familiar with, with HashiCorp, uh, just wanna go over a little bit here. We were founded in 2012. Um, we focus on infrastructure automation workflows and how they affect your journey to the cloud. All of our solutions, you know, that you see here on this on the slide here, are uh, available as open source, and we have four that are uh, available as an enterprise solution with advanced features that an enterprise would need. And as a company, we have a large open source community that helps drive innovation and evolution of our products. So as you can see, we have many customers, large and small, that use HashiCorp solutions as part of their core business um, to help deliver their own solutions to their customers and businesses. So we have customers in, in the Fortune 10 and Fortune 500 that use our products. Um, the, the infrastructure automation challenges that we address also touch different types of industries and different use cases as well. So why are we here talking about security? You know, why HashiCorp and, you know, maybe why does HashiCorp Vault exist? So as you can see here, cybersecurity losses have been uh, pretty significant lately, right? As you see, there's $6 trillion in estimated losses in the last year, and that's total value of those losses. These attacks that we're seeing are going to continue and become more advanced. A good example is the uh, SolarWinds attack. It was probably one of the most uh, advanced credential targeting attack we've ever seen. And we, we expect that to kind of continue as a trend. So HashiCorp Vault can help keep your credentials safe. Um, as you see here, many of the companies that suffered breaches recently um, turned to Vault to secure those common secrets that are used for you know, their, their cloud deployments or infrastructure deployments. So where do we see, you know, security traditionally focused? Um, traditionally with on-prem data centers, we sort of used a four wall perimeter barrier for security, right? Anything inside these walls was considered safe. Anything outside the walls was not safe. Um, and this was mainly because we had a physical space with physical objects that we could see, feel and touch that, you know, we're, we're in our perimeter and we, we could really secure them in a, in a physical fashion. But, you know, that's kind of changed, right? In the new world, you're going to have to include all these items, on-prem dedicated hardware, private cloud systems, public cloud systems, and consumer-based cloud systems. So we're moving from a, you know, a static known environment to a more dynamic, always changing environment uh, with our infrastructure. So the growth of public cloud data centers has shifted the mindset from looking at a infrastructure as a system of record to uh, systems of engagement, which you know really opens it up and allows organizations to focus on the data trends and less about how infrastructure is actually managed. All right, so in the tra traditional data center um, security model, you're aware of where everything is, where everything sits, what the element, what elements are visible. Everything is based on you know, IP address sits in a physical location behind a locked door. And again, security is focused on the network or the perimeter using IP-based security. Everything inside is trusted, everything outside is untrusted. So this is not necessarily true in a modern data center, right? Um, where infrastructure sits in different cloud environments with different identity-based security systems. In these environments, you may have static infrastructure mixed with dynamic infrastructure. Um, how do you keep up with the changes to ensure that you're able to secure everything? In the modern data center, how do you create the sort of security you can with traditional data centers? We at HashiCorp believe we have the answer and you'll learn more about 
our approach today. So here at HashCorp, we look at security more from an identity perspective with IP kind of moving to the background. Although IP is still important, it's not the focus of security. If we look at a typical security access, we broke, break those into four categories. So machine authentication and authorization, machine to machine access, human to machine access, and then you know what commonly everyone is used to human authentication and authorization. So HashiCorp looks at this solution as a zero trust approach. You no longer have a physical boundary. You must deny everything, authenticate and authorize everything and, and deny every access to everything. Sorry, was there a question? All right, so how do you have machines or non-human actors authenticate and authorize themselves? How do these machines access data or systems? So in 2015, we introduced Vault. Vault addresses the machine authentication and authorization with tight control and access to, to secrets. And secrets, you know, these can be many things. They could be certificates, they could be credentials, they could be tokens, basically anything that you want to secure um, or protect. So how does Vault work? So the way Vault works is that, you know, a client makes a request and this, this client can be human or machine-based. Vault then acts as a security broker using any number of identity providers to validate and verify identity, identity before granting access to secure secrets. We support a number of proven and trusted identity providers like Okta or AWS. These identities can be dynamic, supporting the identity that is associated with the environment the clients are working within at the moment, like AWS credentials for deploying EC2 instances. Vault then uses access policies to determine what the client has access to within Vault, and the clients can now access secrets securely and act upon them. So there's a lot of interest in Vault uh, since its release. We've had more than a half a million downloads to support Vault and Kubernetes alone, and over you know, 15 million downloads of Vault by itself. Uh, many customers are downloading, loaning, downloading and learning the value of Vault today, and we even have some of the most secure-minded industries like finance uh, downloading and using our product. So when we talk about Vault and its ability to influence how organizations authorize users across systems, we see sort of three major use cases. Vault as an identity broker credential management, secret management, store, uh, data encryption, using Vault as an encryption endpoint, removing the need for applications or developers to own the encryption process on their end. And then advanced data protection, the ability to integrate into existing tools like databases and manage their encryption keys as well. So the key to Vault is the idea of identity brokering. Clients provide identity to Vault, get authenticated across multiple clouds and endpoints. And because we can integrate with those trusted identities, we can re reduce overhead to set up, configure, and manage identity within your enterprise. So Vault is available as a self-managed solution but we also now have a cloud hosted uh, and managed service for Vault. This provides a way to start using Vault um, capabilities quickly without worrying about infrastructure needs that you might uh, have to build to support Vault. So the vision to make it easier for customers to begin using our tools really quickly and easily is you know sort of this push button deployment where you log in, 
name your cluster, and within moments, you're able to use a fully managed infrastructure vault platform uh, within your multi-cloud workflow. All right, so now let's talk about the next uh, pillar here, machine to machine access. So think containers talking to containers or bare metal talking to bare metal in this instance. So when we think about this, it's kind of a network problem, two machines communicating with each other. And this is where our console product comes in. Console is the heart soul of, of our connectivity solution. It is a service networking solution to allow machines to communicate with each other efficiently and securely. So console provides a network automation solution around three major use cases. So the first one there is service discovery. This provides a way for services to register themselves, whether on-prem or in the cloud through a global catalog. We are starting to abstract away the IP, identify services by name, no matter where they reside. And with the built-in health monitoring, uh, within your monitoring of your systems, we're also know whether the service is available or not. So multi-platform service mesh, this provides a means to overlay a logical network around the services you care about. The logical network can span public and you know, private cloud infrastructure as needed. And then this ensures that every connection is authorized and encrypted. And then lastly, network infra infrastructure automation. This provides a way to interact with middleware components like firewalls or routers or load balancers. So with this, we can actually provide dynamic configurations about the state of applications on your network in real time without requiring you know, a user to submit a ticket to the network team to have those components updated and wait days or weeks. So saving time and money in that process. So let's go through each of these. So multi-cloud service mesh, built on the service discovery mechanism, we can now attach identity and facilitate networking between multiple services. So the service mesh ensures that every connection is authorized by proving identity on both sides and secures the data end to end with traffic encrypted at transit. So network infrastructure automation. Oops, did I skip one? Allows your middleware devices to react to dynamic services. Um, changes using the global services catalog. So the catalog, you know, collects the information on these uh, services and, and can dynamically uh, provide the information to your systems or other services. So, you know, in the scenario, maybe you're scaling up Kubernetes containers up or down based on demand. Console can ensure that your network systems are automatically aware of those changes and propagate those changes. So console is a shared registry that gives you the flexibility and operate logical network across multiple clouds. Um, you know, again, we're looking at, you know, a million plus monthly downloads uh, and 50, you know, thousand uh, agents. So guiding principles. So our application-based networking is where applications are identifying themselves by name right, and decoupling the network operations again from IP, where IP can still exist, be used, but it's pushing the background. It's not the focus of security um, or connectivity for those, those uh, services any longer. And identity becomes the new means of providing zero trust rather than using IPs. So as you see through the, you know, stream of all of this, we're really focusing on uh, identity as, you know, the, the, zero trust solution versus that physical IP or, or physical uh, security solution. So as with Vault, we have both self-managed and fully managed console offering. So we offer HCP console, which you know allows customers to auto provision fully managed product infrastructure 
on any cloud. Again, very similar to the Bolt solution. So our next category is really human authentication and authorization. You know, how do human beings actually authenticate? How do we do this in a trusted and secure way? And this is probably what everyone, you know, is used to. So user identity used to be established via maybe an employee badge or a driver's license to access a physical location. And then over time, you know, we introduced uh, private SSO. So maybe you logged into LDAP with a username and password, um, or maybe even used a physical device to identify yourself and allow you access to those, you know, resources that were available to you in the, in the private network. Well, and more recently, cloud-based solutions provide access to applications and services with a single identity or SSO. So cloud SSO provides a single way to access all your resources, no matter where you're located. And then finally, the last category to address is how do human beings get access to the services, systems, and data to make dis, uh, work decisions? So how do they do this authentication or authorization to be able to access systems that they need to be able to either interact with or, or use on a daily basis? So for this, we introduced HashiCorp Boundary. It's a new way to automate and protect access to applications infrastructure, endpoints, what we think access management should look like ultimately. So how do we interact with systems traditionally? So first users have to request access to the systems they need. Maybe they're given VPN access or SSH keys or something along those lines. This has to be done for every new user. So do you create new credentials for every new user? Do you rotate those credentials? How do you manage the process efficiently? How do you scale this process? So onboarding obviously becomes difficult. This process all require, also requires access to a network, to those systems, to the, those users uh, need access to that private network and users can now connect to really any system on that private network, which you know, could be an issue. Then you have firewall rules, right? That apply, you know, policies based on IP. What happens when those systems change dynamically like those services? IP start to become, you know, brittle. It works great in a static environment, but breaks down when you start to get to a more dynamic uh, environment. Okay, then to access those systems or applications, you'll need separate credentials for those specific apps or, or services. And now you're exposing uh, those private credentials uh, to the user who can then expose them elsewhere, either through you know code or text files or, or however they're gonna store or remember those credentials. Okay. So with Boundary, we take the approach of allowing you to log in with your trusted identity, like LDAP, as an example. Then your identity is kind of combined with policies to determine what roles or services you have access to. And Boundary then controls your access to those resources privately, never really exposing network information or system credentials that may be necessary to, to access that particular resource. So in this scenario, we're, we're securing the, the private network uh, information, the, the private credential information, but we're still giving those users access to the systems they need. So how does this work? Boundary starts with, with a user authenticating through a trusted form of identity like you know Okta or Ping or anything along those lines. Then it provides a logical set of authorization rules based on the user type and service type. So we do this through the global service catalog dynamically, doing it based on, you know, users, a database admin, they're getting access to database systems. Lastly, when the user connects, Boundary can use short-lived credentials to provide access to those systems. 
So Boundary provides access to the applications and critical systems with fine grade authorizations without managing credentials or really exposing your private network. Right. So what are the goals of Boundary? First, on-demand access, right? Securely access applications, systems, data without the need to create or store credentials, network information, IP addresses. You just log into your trusted identity and get instant access. Next, you know, dynamic environments. So eliminate the complexity and time spent managing access to ephemeral and dynamic applications, hosts, services, or even, you know, cloud resources. So it's really easy to use. Um, a new platform agnostic way to access applications and host across clouds, Kubernetes clusters, on-premise data centers through an automated workflow that works with existing tooling. And lastly, like all of our solutions, it's free with open source. So that's the hero or the hash the HashiCorp zero trust approach. Um, we have Vault for machine authentication and authorization, console for machine to machine access or service to service access, and boundary for human to machine access. So that's our zero trust approach. Thank you for your time today and enjoy the session later with Vault. Fiona, I'll turn it back to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Donnie. Appreciate it. Um, great. You know, with that said, we're going to pass things over to Kevin, who's going to start walking us through Vault and the various lab exercises. So uh, welcome, Kevin, and thank you again, Donnie. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'll turn on my camera for a minute just to say hi to everyone. I'm Kevin Cochran. I'm a solutions engineer here at HashiCorp uh, based out of Atlanta, and this is great to have everyone from all over the U.S., um, but I'll go ahead and turn off my camera for the re remainder. Uh, that way we can make sure all your bandwidth stays with you. So, um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about Vault um, specifically and get into a couple of different use cases that are pretty common. Uh, they're usually pretty quick wins um, that you can just pretty much start with today uh, and go download. But these uh, the workshops that we're going to be doing to, a little bit later on, the hands-on labs, uh, they are publicly available, so they'll be available to you uh, going forward. So if you need to revisit them at any time, you forget what you did, you know, a month from now, um, if you're like me, then yeah, just go back and, and open them back up. So we'll include those links in the follow-up uh, email as well. Um, so with that, let's get started. Uh, we are going to have a couple of breaks once we get into the labs. Um, I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this link into the chat. So if you want to follow along, uh, please do. There are links that we have throughout um, throughout here. So um, let's see here. There we go. All right, so uh, again, feel free to, to click on that and follow along with what we're doing today. And uh, we'll skip introductions. That's primarily for whenever we're in person. Uh, it takes a whole lot longer when you've got 70 something people uh, versus you know, a room of 20. So, um, but let's just take a look real quick at what we're gonna do today. So we are gonna talk about Vault, uh, talk about how we use Vault, uh, running it, taking a look at the secrets engines and the authentication methods and, and then policy. And then we'll actually get into hands-on labs where you can actually go in and start playing around with stuff. Um, so gonna be an exciting day. Uh, and we will probably be done here about two to two and a half hours. So it's not gonna take too long to get through a lot of this. So we're not gonna take, take up any more time than we need to. Um, if you haven't already done this, you should have already received some instructions on how to, uh, you know, on the on the instruct lab. Um, you should have already received instructions on how to do that. So if you haven't done it yet, go to instruct, that's I-N-S-T-R-U-Q-T dot com and create yourself an account there because that's where we'll be doing these labs. Uh, so the first six chapters are actually just going to be uh, primarily lecture and we'll get, uh, you know, so that's not going to take 
uh, too incredibly long, but it is just kind of, you know, explain and kind of dive a little bit deeper into what Vault is than what uh, Donnie was able to. Uh, he kind of gave us a, a high level overview. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into Vault today. Um, so with that said, um, you know, for those who are brand new to Vault, um, and you're like, hey, what is this thing? It is a secrets management tool. Uh, you can run it anywhere. It's cloud agnostic. The important thing here is that Vault is API driven. It is built around automation. It, everything from ground up was built for automation. That's always been the problem with secrets is, you know, you have secrets and they're always uh, handled in a manual fashion because, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, we want to keep this stuff as safe as possible. We don't want to have computers just arbitrarily being able to uh, access our, you know, really super secret stuff. And, you know, what is a secret? Well, that can be anything from a username, password, that could be a, uh, an API key, that could be a, a certificate, anything that we need to keep safe uh, and, and away from public view. Um, so that's, so that's in, in, you know, in a nutshell, what Vault is in the problem space that, uh, that it's addressing. Um, but there's a lot of different uh, secrets engines that are available. There's kind of two, two main things that we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, you know, kind of two pieces to Vault that are really important. One is identity. Uh, that's how do we access Vault. And once you get into Vault, you know, what are you able to do with secrets? And then that, that kind of opens it up to uh, policy and things like that. So those are kind of the building blocks. Um, and we'll dive a little bit deeper too into uh, how Vault actually manages a lot of these things. But first, let's talk uh, a little bit of a high level, you know, what is what security is today. So this is kind of our, uh, you know, castle and moat architecture that we've done for for decades, literally decades where, you know, hey, so long as you're inside the uh, uh, as long as you're inside the castle walls, it's, it's not a, it's not going to be a problem. We're going to trust you. Um, well, even back then, we, we know that that's not exactly the case. You'd always, you know, that's how they would get spies in and they would they would wreak havoc inside the castle walls. And that's exactly what happens in today's world as well. Um, and it's even more prevalent today. So things were built on, you know, the premise of, you know, you got a perimeter security, uh, you might have a firewall and everything inside that firewall we assume is safe. Um, but that's no longer the case. I mean, no, no one really, especially with the, the advent of the cloud and the, the security models, yeah, there are port scanners, there are still tools out there that do that. But the biggest piece that people are after these days or that, that you know, bad actors are after are, are credentials, are API keys. They're, they're, they're after secrets because once you get that secret, it allows you in. It's like sending that spy into the, uh, into the castle walls. You're able to slip in unnoticed because, hey, it's you know, somebody else. There's no intrusion detection that you know, sends off any kind of alerts. It's, hey, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's Bob over there in, in, uh, you know, in accounting and it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, only it's a bad actor. So uh, we can't trust anything inside, inside that firewall anymore. And also with, with traditional methods, everything was kind of locked down by IP addresses. We had, you know, static databases and a lot of rules built around that. Uh, credentials are stored in, in spreadsheets, uh, source code, configuration files, things like that. Um, a lot of things that we didn't have a whole lot of tools to deal with back in the day. So we just used native operating system uh, you know, security to, to clamp down things that only certain people can read files or things like that. So uh, a lot of work built around security and we did the best we could, uh, but oftentimes it wasn't enough. Uh, so again, you know, the, the main problems that we have with traditional security are IP, uh, IP based rules and hard coding uh, different things with with services and you know difficult to rotate keys and things like that. I think I think a lot of us have uh, you know can identify with this type of scenario. You know whether it's past life, whether it's current life. Um, these are things that have, have plagued IT for a long time. 
Um, so this is kind of a, a, an interesting little history lesson, just kind of like we, we know everything comes back around, just like bell bottoms. You know, it's like everything comes back around and who would have known that yurts uh, uh, would last as long as they did. <laughs> but this is a funny little history lesson to kind of illustrate uh, a little bit about, you know, modern how we do things today and even just looking back at uh, the Mongolians and how Genghis Khan, um, what they would do is they would actually, you know, they when they needed to move, they actually picked up their home and everything they own and they moved. And just to think about, you know, this type of nomadic approach, um, the Mongol warriors, they would actually bring, you know, three or four horses with them each. And they would just rotate through the horses and they would go further. Um, they said they could even uh, like move their troops up to 100 miles a day, which that's the 13th century. I mean, you know, we can do that in a car, but I mean, I've driven across the U.S. and, you know, getting, you know, 800 miles in in a day is, is exhausting. Imagine doing that whenever we didn't have cars. Um, so, yeah, they were they were very adaptable. Um, they were more resilient to their enemies because they, they didn't have half the time their enemies didn't know where they were. Um, they just had, you know, boom, here comes the Mongols out of nowhere. And they actually ended up conquering nearly all of uh, continental Asia, the Middle East and parts of Eastern Europe uh, with this style. So um, kind of a fun, fun little uh, history lesson to kind of say, you know, this is really, you know, not having a defined parameter reduces your, uh, your, your, your risk and that, you know, uh, what people, the, the attack surface that people are able to, to come to. So it's really enforced by identity. So we'll move, move on to uh, identity-based security. Um, so what we look at here, think of your phone um, and think like 10, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, you know, or maybe 15 years ago, you know, you, you wanted to secure your phone. So you would put in a pin, you, you know, have your super secret pin. But the thing is, is that if anyone has that pin, it doesn't matter who they are. They could be a good person, bad person, indifferent, doesn't really matter. If they can figure out that pin, they can get into your phone and have access to everything there as if it were you. Um, so having a pin does not identify you, it really just says, yeah, I can get in. It's like having a key to your home. Um, whereas identity is more like, you know, your, your thumbprint or, or facial recognition on your phone where it's like, yeah, I'll let you in if I know for sure that it's you. And even if you have a pin, that's fine, but I still want to make sure it's you. And so that's kind of where we look at Vault and, and where we look at really identity-based security. Uh, we, for Vault, Vault uses uh, kind of native methods, whether it's with the clouds, Kubernetes, uh, anything that we have, if there's a native um, identity management system, Vault is going to integrate with and be able to do that. So you, what you have here is you've got a client, typically an application. Like I said earlier, Vault is really built around automation. So you're going to have a client. That client might be a, an application. Say it's a shipping application. It needs to get the, the FedEx uh, or UPS or USPS API key uh, or all of the above. So it needs to get that out of Vault. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to connect to Vault and say, hey, I need to log in. Uh, it's going to use that underlying uh, integrated uh, identity management piece to say, hey, I can let you in. So, for instance, with, uh, with AWS, you know, you're going to use IAM or with Azure, you're going to use managed identities there and so on and so forth. And so you're going to have a native way to identify that application actually is who they say they are and they have the ability to access what? Well, we use policies. So, so just because they can authenticate doesn't give them freedom to the whole world. We're just going to say, okay, we've got a tunnel that goes straight from the front door <laughs> right to your guest room. You don't get to look at everything that, that's around you. So, so, what we, so what we do is you, know, you let them in, you have policies that govern what they can access and what secrets engines that they can get to, whether it's just uh, KV storage or dynamic credentials uh, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of how uh, Vault works. If you want to take a look at that link at the bottom, uh, that does uh, link to a the identity-based security and low trust networks white paper. So I did just cover all of this, uh, I think, in a, a, a little bit, but we'll still cover it. Vault uh, 
was designed to address these the needs of the modern applications, um, and it still can actually work in traditional uh, uh, places as well. We do have tools for that, but you know some of the things that are are different are say dynamic and short lived credentials. Um, there's tokens that are short lived. Uh, credentials and entities can be easily invalidated, and I think that the story here is that with Vault, uh, we don't just assume that Vault is going to keep all your bad people out. Um, we do the best we can. It's the best tool out there for uh, for storing secrets. But um, in the event that something does happen, Vault does have several ways to mitigate. Uh, you know, any kind of a breach or, or uh, attack that happens, uh, whether it's invalidating credentials, tokens, um, you know, sealing vault, uh, a lot of different things that you can do uh, if there's a, if there's an issue and it doesn't have to be a, you know, a super mega blast radius. We can actually, if you see, you know, activity on a particular role, uh, we don't have to shut the entire vault down and disrupt the whole business. We can actually uh, zero in on where we, uh, are seeing some suspicious activity. Uh, so a lot of really cool uh, pieces there that are that are that make administering managing your secrets um, pretty flexible. So the secrets engines, this is just kind of a small sampling. There's actually uh, quite a number more than what, what you see here. But uh, if you click on that link there, it'll take you right to uh, the secrets engines. But there's uh, various things, a lot of different databases that are supported for uh, dynamic dynamic database credentials. Um, you can have cloud credentials automatically generated for you and, and expired. And by the way, Vault manages the whole life cycle, as you'll see uh, a little bit later on in one of our labs. Vault manages the whole life cycle of these uh, of these expiring uh, secrets. So you know, say for your database, it'll actually go in uh, when when it's time for you know when that credential expires, Vault will actually go back into the database and remove it, uh, much like it went in to create it. So it will manage the full life cycle of that. So um, this, this slide's a little bit, uh, uh, can be a little bit overwhelming to look at, but if we just kind of take a look at what Vault is doing, and you can take a, if you want to dive in and get really into the weeds with, with what's going on here, click on that link down there and it'll uh, it'll actually take you in and, and explain a whole lot more, but just at a high level, um, you know, Vault uh, has a Vault has an encryption key that uh, that encryption key is actually stored with the data, but that encryption key is actually also encrypted. Um, and what's important to know here is that's where your unseal keys come from, uh, or if you're using auto unseal. Uh, so the unsealed keys are actually shards of the key by using Shamir uh, key sharing, and it actually shards it out to, by default, it's five different keys. You need a minimum of three of those keys, those, uh, those shards, to build back your encryption key, your, your master encryption key. So that, that key is actually going to unlock Vault and have Vault uh, be able to do encryption operations. Um, when we talk about sealing and unsealing, uh, you think about if we want to put it in really simple terms, when Vault is sealed, it does not have its encryption key. It doesn't have it in memory. It can't do any operations. It's pretty much dead. You know, you can, you know, do the core things like starting the service and stopping the service, but you're not going to be able to access anything. You're not going to be able to authenticate. When Vault does have its encryption key in memory, it is unsealed. And so that's why if you really feel like you have a, you know, a, you're running vault, you feel like some, something's gotten out of hand and you're, you're not quite sure what, what's going on, you need to really just have a quick way to just stop everything, uh, that's when you would do a vault operator seal and it will, it will shut down access to everything. Another thing to point out here is you've got your uh, audit device and you can have up to two audit devices. But Vault does audit first, so you get a true uh, a true aud uh, audit. Um, so if Vault is unable to uh, write to uh, an audit device um, at all, then it will not allow the operation to continue. Even if it's a write, it doesn't matter. Um, if Vault can't write to the audit device, it will not allow the operation to continue. So you know you always have a true uh, uh, full audit uh, and there's nothing that can kind of sneak in there. And then, of course, you have a storage backend. Um, 
if you have a, a you know huge huge operation with you know, high performances needed, uh, you can use something like console. Uh, but for most most cases, you can actually just build, use the built-in storage. Uh, it uses Vault uses Raft uh, for its internal storage, and you can just use that. That's going to be uh, probably the preferred way. Certainly makes management a whole lot easier. Um, and then we'll kind of get into a little bit more later, but that's kind of the bulk of, of what, what's really going on with Vault and how it's operating. So high availability, this is uh, actually uses console. As you see here, we can just kind of uh, you know, pretend like the console is not there and we'll, we'll go with our three, uh, three node cluster there um, because it is going to use uh, internally. So for open source, um, you can actually, for, well, for open source or enterprise, you can actually put uh, all three nodes or five nodes uh, behind a load balancer and the load balancer can send uh, those packets to, or those requests into any one of those. Now for open source, everything is forwarded over to the primary node, the leader node. Um, when you get into enterprise, it is automatically set to be read replica. So they will at least um, service all reads. Uh, all writes will of course be forwarded over to the primary. Um, but all reads will be serviced in, in enterprise. But for open source, you can still leverage, you know, having that and at least manage a little bit of your uh, your load through uh, through your cluster and just have everything uh, go to whichever whichever server is available to take that. In this case, we have uh, uh, this is in a single region, uh, or that might be a single data center. Uh, and then we have three different zones that availability zones that, that one server would go into each. You do not want to put this, you know, put in this particular setup here, um, you do not want to put those nodes uh, in other data centers or uh, other regions where the latency is a little bit higher. You will experience flapping and things like that, which we don't, uh, your, your cluster is not going to be stable. So this is for high availability within a specific region or data center. <clears throat> now, if we want to uh, expand on that and say, hey, let's, you know, we've got several data centers or we're, we're in several clouds or several regions in a cloud, uh, you can use performance replication. And this is where you're going to have your, uh, your primary cluster that's going to kind of act as the, uh, the, main, the main one, but you can have clusters all over the place and be able to replicate the data from the primary to any one of those. And then of course, each individual cluster can actually have its own. So if you're looking at things like GDPR and still being able to have some communication between, uh, between the clusters, you can achieve that with Vault using performance replication. But this allows you to, to reach across uh, multiple regions, across the globe. Um, we have a lot of customers who do that, who have, you know, you know, service things over in, uh, over in APAC, things like that. So quick review, um, what we learned here. Um, so Vault is a secrets management system. And it's like, again, a secret is uh, anything that you need to keep private um, from out of, out of public view or out of even internally, you know, keep it in the hands of, of the fewest. Uh, it's API driven and can run anywhere. You can run it on your laptop. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi. Of course, for corporate stuff, you know, you probably want to look more towards your data center and uh, in any cloud, uh, but it is pretty versatile where you can run it. Um, it is designed around untrusted networks. Uh, so zero or low trust networks, that's where Vault works really well. Uh, it can be used to authenticate users and applications um, and really used in an automated fashion. Uh, and as we'll see here shortly, we've got some secrets engines that allow you to, uh, you know, dynamically create credentials um, and have put a time limit on them so they'll expire after a certain period of time. And of course, it is uh, it can be run highly available. So chapter two, um, <clears throat> we will talk about how we are interacting with Vault. So there are, you know, kind of typical three ways that you would expect uh, for an automation tool. You're going to have a CLI, you're going to have uh, the user interface, and you're going to have the API. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this. And then uh, after this chapter, we'll take a, a short 10-minute uh, break, and then we'll come back um, and go through the next few chapters. So just a quick heads up. Um, so 
starting with the CLI. So Vault is a, uh, it is a single binary. It's written in Go, uh, like all of our tools are. Uh, it's written in Go. Um, you pretty much, it runs on uh, multiple OSs as well as um, multiple architectures. Um, so you can actually download it. Um, you can click on the link there, or you can go to releases.hashicorp.com and take a look at all the tools that we have out there, including Vault um, and including by, uh, Boundary. If you uh, if that caught your interest, uh, you can actually download it from there as well. So installing it, uh, especially like on your laptop, you pretty much just click on it, download it, unzip it, put it, put it in the path, and then just type Vault and you'll get, uh, get a quick, uh, you know, whatever your uh, you know, help, you know, what all the commands are and things like that. So it's pretty easy to install uh, and get running because it is a single binary. You don't have to worry about multiple libraries and all that kind of stuff. So some of the basic commands, you know, vault does kind of run on this, um, you know, you, you run, you type in vault and then you're going to give it, you know, kind of a direction to go. And then there will be sub commands beyond that. But, uh, you know, a couple of things that you want to look at, if you just, like I said, if you type in vault and hit enter, you're going to get a list of things that you can do with vault. Uh, you definitely want to keep, uh, keep track of your version, make sure that you're, you're on the latest. We do, um, you know, especially for security, things like that, we do keep up with vault and, and, uh, um, uh, bug fixes, enhancements, things like that. Uh, another couple of common ones, vault read, vault write, uh, and then of course, vault dash help if you need to uh, dive in a little bit more to any one of those commands. So there's a couple of modes that you can run uh, vault in. Um, you can run it in a dev mode, and I'll talk about that here in a second. And it's really only for development environments. Prod is really more where you have a configuration file and you really start, you know, kind of tweaking how you want it to run. Uh, and it's really intended more for like staging and production, things like that. Though we do have, um, and I will say dev mode, uh, I'll, I'll even say it's even more for like personal development because when we get into dev teams, um, and you have to have one that's up and running, you probably do want to have that configured uh, more as a production style. If, if you've got a lot of different teams hitting it and it needs to be uh, running for a while. So a couple of modes about uh, running in dev, and this is actually just a, a command that you would uh, use with vault. Uh, that's, you know, it's dash dev, and then you can give it several parameters. Uh, so it is a mode that the vault runs in. It is not secure. Uh, it's great to if you just need to spin something up and see what what vault is, do some quick testing. Uh, but it stores everything in memory, so as soon as you stop it, everything's gone. Um, it's automatically unsealed, and you can specify the root token. So again, these are really handy things for if you just need to spin it up, do a couple of quick tests, um, see what you know what the capabilities are. Uh, but definitely. Uh, very insecure. It's not, you cannot use something like this in production, but it is there for convenience. So the Vault UI, um, and we'll, we'll just here in a second, we'll, yeah, we'll do this. Um, so the Vault UI, so this is where you sign in. Um, this is really more, you know, human to uh, to machine access. So you're going to have your typical SSO, your LDAP, uh, even just a standard token like you see here on this screen. So that's kind of the, the login for the UI. We are going to have this in the challenge. So you'll be able to kind of uh, take a look at it. Um, but your primary method, as soon as you spin up Vault, you're going to have the root token. That's going to get you in uh, to be able to start configuring things. And then you'll want to configure things like LDAP or SSO, whatever it is that you've got um, you know, for, for your typical users. And you will... Um, you will be doing uh, a lab, I think, on this one. So you, whenever you first log in, um, if you're a new user to the system, it will uh, present to you to go do a tour. Uh, it does give you a quick, you don't have to do it. You can close it out if you know, you've seen it before, that's fine, but it does actually walk you through you know, quick how, how to get to everything and, and how to find things. Then the Vault API is a full REST API. The entire, all of Vault, the CLI, the API, everything is built off of the API. So 
Uh, so the API is complete. Uh, there are hundreds of endpoints that, uh, that you can use uh, for various engines. Uh, and it is highly configurable. So this, this is where you're going to be able to have your, your applications communicate with Vault. There are some libraries out there. We've got, uh, I think we've got two that are official, um, more to come that are official in the future. But for now, we do have a lot of community um, libraries that are available that you can use. Uh, so you can uh, look that through our website and find more about that. But the API is, is very robust. And we're just going to use the curl command here since that's nice and convenient and pretty much built into just about every Linux system. So uh, we'll get more into that. If you do this particular issue, this command that you see on your screen, this is what you're going to get. You're going to uh, get the health check, you know, what's uh, what's running, what the version is and uh, you know, whether it's sealed or not and so on and so forth. So authenticating uh, to the API, this is really more um, the machine to machine access. So the, the UI and the CLI is going to have the human um, human to machine. The API is really going to be focused more on the uh, machine to machine. Um, so most of the API endpoints do require authentication. Uh, there's just a couple that don't, that really don't really even need authentication, such as the one we just looked at, Sys Health. Um, that doesn't really need to have someone authenticate to get to that because it doesn't give out anything that's that's unsafe. Um, but you do include a header in the API with uh, its X vault token, as you can see on your screen. So that's a header that's going to include the token that you have uh, received once you've successfully authenticated. You'll get a token, and that token is what's used to interact with vault uh, for that application. Uh, all right, so let's do a quick review and then we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and we'll continue on to the first lab. So um, so we, what we looked at today is the CLI, the UI, the API, looking at you know various vault commands and uh, just letting you know about the dev and uh, prod modes for vault. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break and uh, we'll come back uh, and be back here at, let's just say, 107 Eastern. And Fiona, do I, need to, um, do I need to turn this back over to you? No, we'll just um, go ahead and uh, Kelly, do you want to pause the recording? And then we will um, be back here at 10.07. We'll see you in a little bit. 10.07, 107 Eastern, depending on where you are. Great, thank you. All right, so um, let's look at running a production vault server. Let me get on the right screen here. Um, all right, so um, running prod mode, like it's what's you know several things that are that are different as far as spinning it up. With with dev, it actually is a flag uh, that you specify on the command line to run vault in dev mode. Now. Uh, leaving all that stuff off and all those dev flags, uh, you will be running in production mode because you'll need to have a configuration file. <clears throat> so that's what you'll do. You'll create a fig configuration file uh, in HCL, and uh, you can also use JSON if you prefer. HCL is just a whole lot easier to deal with. Um, and you'll be able to tweak it however you want to, specify your back end, specify the, 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 the ports and the, the communication modes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, will be available in your configuration file. Uh, then you'll, of course, you'll want to create your uh, your service, your Linux service, or your Windows service. Uh, start the server, and uh, once you get started, you'll you'll initialize it, get the unsealed keys and an initial root token, and then you can unseal Vault and begin using it. So that's kind of the sounds pretty simple, and and honestly, it, it it's really not that hard to do. So it's um, like most of the time when I'm just you know wanting to play around with dev i actually have a configuration file that i use and just spin it up so it doesn't doesn't really take a whole lot to just spin up a single node cluster just to uh, start looking around and, and doing some stuff with um so like i said some of the things that that you'll see in the configuration file are going to be your communication and where the storage is now the seal stanza is where you can actually kind of bypass the whole using unseal keys and actually have a key management tool 
you uh, store that uh, that the the main encryption key or not the main encryption key, but the uh, uh, the one that break you know gets you into and unseals vault. So you can actually store that uh, rather than having to keep track of unseal keys. Um, so that things like might be if you're on prem, you might have an HSM. If you're uh, in one of the clouds, you can use you know either you know. Uh, key uh, Azure Key Vault or uh, AWS is KMS. <clears throat> uh, same thing with GCP. So, yeah, you can you can actually have that stored there. Uh, what your log level is, whether you want the API running or not, um, and again, kind of some communication pieces there. Uh, all that stuff can be specified in the config file. So to start the Vault server, like I said, you pretty much just create a service, you uh, run it, you definitely don't want to put the dash <clears throat> dev option on there. Um, initializing the Vault cluster, of course, that only, is, as you would expect, it only has to be done once. Um, but uh, each Vault cluster, when you're creating a, a Vault cluster, each node does need to be initialized before you connect them together. Um, and this is done using the init command. Uh, by default, it will give you uh, five unsealed keys, or yeah, five unsealed keys, three of which must, any, any of the three uh, can be used to unseal Vault. Uh, you can change that if you want to say, if you've got, you've only got three operators, um, maybe you say generate three key shards and, you know, all three are, are required to, to un unseal vault or maybe use two of them or something like that, but you can change uh, how many uh, unsealed keys are generated. Again, if you're using um, a KMS for key storage for auto unseal, um, then you're going to be looking at, you know, recovery keys versus unsealed keys. Um, so then the, the command, um, You'll want to issue the command to, to unseal. So once you've once you've actually set a net, it's going to give you the the unseal keys and the initial root token, so you can actually go in and start configuring Vault. Um, talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but uh, Vault, you know, unsealing and sealing. That's whether Vault has its encryption key or not, and whether it can do operations. Um, so Vault, as soon as you restart the service, if you're not using an auto unseal. Vault will be sealed, and that is kind of a security measure in case someone's trying to gain access. Um, they can't get in, and they think, "Oh, well, if I just restart the service, then no." If they restart the service, it's going to make it even more complicated for them. So, um, so yeah, every time the service starts, it does need to be unsealed. Uh, auto unseal will automatically do that for you. Um, if you're managing the, the seal keys yourself, you just simply say vault operator unseal and each person who's holding a key uh, can do the same thing and enter their, their unseal key. So we saw earlier, if you use the API endpoint sys health, uh, it'll give you a status. You can also do the same thing at the CLI and you can say vault status, and it will tell you whether it's sealed or unsealed, what if it's in HA mode or not, um, and, and whether it's a leader or not, it'll actually tell you everything you need to know, uh, just a, a quick and dirty. So uh, it'll also tell you if it's running as a performance standby. So quick review, um, we learned about the configuration file. That's kind of where you run vault for real in, in prod mode. Um, once you, you know, set up your, your actual configuration file and get vault where it needs to be on the system, you'll need to uh, initialize it using vault and operator init, and then you'll need to unseal it before you can start using it. Let's take a look at the secrets engines. Um, so. Uh, we already talked a little bit earlier about some of them and kind of the premise behind them, but we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper into uh, what we've got available. Um, a lot of these are available in open source and enterprise. There's actually a handful more that are more for, you know, larger use cases, things around tokenization and uh, specialized encryption, things like that. So, um, but a lot of these are, are kind of core uh, secrets engines that you can use. You know, most people, I think probably number one is the standard KV, right? It's username, password. Um, you know, a lot of the systems still have those today. So uh, that's pretty commonly used. 
Um, PKI, uh, that's a, another one that's pretty popular. So Vault can automatically rotate your uh, the certificates on your services. Um, I'm sure some of you have probably run into this before. Um, every customer I talk to that, that uses uh, you know, TLS or SSL for their services, everyone's like, yeah, this has happened, where all of a sudden, you know, everybody's working and then all of a sudden a, a service uh, goes down and everyone's like, what happened? You know, no one, no one ever does that. No one ever touches that. Well, it's because the certificate expired and someone forgot to issue a CSR and go through and get it. Usually you have downtime of, you know, on average a couple hours, sometimes more, sometimes less, but uh, either way, no one really likes to maintain those PKI certificates. I don't know anybody who does. Um, so that's why I just let Vault do it. And this engine will actually go out and uh, when it when a certificate starts reaching uh, its expiry, it'll just reach back, the agent will reach back out to Vault, uh, generate a new certificate, put it in place and bounce the service if it needs to be bounced. And uh, you know, everything's good. So you don't, you don't even have to manage it anymore. Um, you know, other things like, you know, uh, Active Directory managing uh, service accounts through that, uh, all of the, the, the credentials through various clouds, uh, database credentials, so things like Oracle, MS SQL, uh, MySQL, Postgres, um, yeah, the Mongo, so a whole bunch of databases that are supported there. Um, and then one more called Transit, that's where you actually have a lot of different, uh, and this is going to be part of our lab, so you're actually going to have various encryption uh, operations available in the Transit engine. So, uh, again, we'll take we'll dive in deeper to that a little bit later. But when you hear we, us talk about encryption as a service, where you can actually have a shared service, developers no longer have to worry about encryption. Uh, you can just kind of turn it over to uh, to Vault and let Vault handle it for you. Uh, just went through all those. I just think this screen is a little bit nicer to look at than this one. So, um, so yeah, we just went through all those. Enabling secrets is pretty pretty easy. Um, like most things in Vault, I mean, it, once you kind of wrap your head around what Vault is and what it's doing, especially around identity and, and you get it set up, uh, most things, most operations are pretty simple. You can enable any one of the secrets engines uh, by just saying Vault secrets enable and then tell it which uh, which engine you want to enable. You can also do it through the UI. This is all talking, you know, CLI here. You can do it through the API as well. Um, and if you say need several different um, uh, versions of the exact same uh, engine. Like for instance, you see AWS here, maybe you need to enable AWS um, you know, three or four times because you have AWS East, you have AWS West, uh, you have AWS in, in Europe. Um, you know, that, that's the way you can actually, you can specify the path, but it's still the same. You know, the, the engine is gonna work the same. You've just enabled it in several different instances of it. So uh, in order to have several of those instances running at the same time, you just have them at different path uh, uh, mount points. All right, so uh, the KV engine, like I said, is you know the most common one used. Um, the, there are two versions of the KV. There's the, the version one that does not have versioning. So if you go in and say, um, you know, your username and password, you go in and change it. Uh, you don't know what it was before. Once you've changed it, it's done. There's no tracking, uh, anything like that. So you'll never be able to go back. Uh, KV version two is the one that we'll be using today. And that one does have versioning. So you can't just arbitrarily go in and change a previous password. You just have to create a new version. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and let's see here, it is not, so that's right, the KV store is actually enabled by default in dev mode, uh, but in prod, there is nothing that's automatically enabled. So for prod, we assume that you're starting from scratch um, and you're going to want to uh, set Vault up the way you want to. So we're not going to just, you know, come in and arbitrarily, you know, stand up secrets engines for you and have them waiting for you. We'll, uh, you'll be able to do that yourself. So the KV Secrets Engine is a little bit different in how it works. As you saw earlier, we had the Vault Read and Vault Write, which is what most Secrets Engines use. The KV Engine uses a little bit different. So uh, you'll enable uh, 
uh, the secrets engine with, you know, if you want the version two, you do a dash version equals two. If you do not specify that, it will just create a version one. So you'll want to make sure that you specify dash version equals two KV. Um, and then we have, you know, more list, put, get, delete. Those are kind of the main commands there that, uh, that you'll have for using the KV store versus a read and a write. All right, take a look again, uh, review what we looked at through the KV store um, and through, through the secrets engine. Um, so uh, from the CLI, of course, you can, again, you can do this through the API or the UI, um, but from the CLI, you just say vault secrets enable. Um, you can specify a path if you want to have multiple instances of that engine running. Um, and, you know, be sure to use, if, you know, be sure you understand the difference between uh, version one and version two of the KV store, most people uh, need and would prefer to have the V2. So make sure that you understand that and you know what you're, uh, what you're enabling. And uh, finally, you can, um, you know, you can get uh, a, an old version of the key using uh, the V2 of KV. So there's a lot of Vs in there. So <laughs> it's, um, so anyway, but you'll, you'll actually see this in, in the lab that we're going to do here shortly. Okay, vault authentication methods. Um, so like I said, you know, the secrets are great, but you won't be able to get to them until you can authenticate with vault and you have permission to do so with the policy. So I think what's coming up, is it the next, yeah, it's not the next one, but we'll, we'll get to policy here. I think it might be in the next chapter where we can see where we can actually clamp things down um, and we'll talk more about security there. Um, but Vault does support uh, quite a different, quite a, quite a number of authentication methods. Again, our goal here is to uh, have Vault use whatever is native to your environment. Um, this, you know, most people are running in cloud today. Um, so we have those clouds there. There are the, what we would refer as more the, the machine to machine authentication methods um, versus the human to machine authentication methods. So, you know, you look at LDAP and, and Okta, things like that are gonna be more human type uh, access. Whereas like with Kubernetes, AWS, those are gonna be more the machine to machine access. Um, so here's more of a comprehensive list of, of methods for users. So you've got your user pass, GitHub, LDAP, Jot, uh, and Okta, whereas for applications, you're going to have AppRoll, the clouds, you know, AWS, Azure, and Google, and Kubernetes. AppRoll is more uh, for, you know, environments that don't have native identity built in. So say like your... Uh, uh, your VMware environment, you're going to be able to use AppRoll for that and still be able to secure things better than you are today. Um, so, yeah, enabling uh, authentication methods is really not much different than secrets. It's you're, you're just going to have different configurations for them, um, but it's going to be, be Vault Auth enable, and then you're going to give it the the engine that you want to or the method that you want to enable. So. If you're using, once again, AWS, yes, there is an AWS secrets engine as well as an AWS authentication method. Uh, sometimes that can get a little bit confusing when you're looking at the screens going, wait, which one do I want? Um, but but this is the, uh, the method where it's using IAM or EC2 authentication. So you can enable it, you can go in and configure it um, and tell it which type you want, start giving it, you know, the data, like if you're using IAM, you can give it the, the ARN to, uh, for the, uh, for the AWS role, and it'll make that integration and really kind of bring the vault into the, uh, that security space. Um, for people, you know, and we're actually going to enable this in one of your, your labs coming up, the user pass. Obviously, user pass is going to be your least, um, you know, the, the one that you don't, you, it'd probably be the last on the list as far as preference. Uh, user pass is what everything uses today. Um, it's, it's pretty common. It's, what, it's what's been out there for, you know, six decades. Um, we just think there's better methods, but we do have this out here in case people need it. Uh, and you can use just your standard username and password. And uh, certainly is the easiest one if you're doing uh, labs <laughs> to just enable this one. It's not super complicated. Uh, 
So um, again, we're going to review, um, you know, what types of entities can authenticate? Well, it's going to be users and applications, and they each kind of have their own authentication method. Um, Vault is actually stores the username and password, so it stores those credentials. We, of course, you know the others are uh, as, well. It also stores uh, the tokens as well if you're using token method. But the other authentication methods are really more just pass through, where it's you know validating. Uh, you know, if you're using LDAP, it's actually going to validate that through your core system. Uh, we're just going to integrate with that. And a uh, user can't access anything outside of, of what they've been given as a policy. And by default, uh, no one has access to anything in Vault. So you can create a user, you can create username, password, and log in. They don't have access to anything until you explicitly grant them access. So we're going to actually talk a little bit more about that now. So on to chapter six, we're going to look at vault policies. Uh, so the policies, as you would expect, um, it's a there is a policy document like you might see in um, uh, in any one of the other clouds. Um, you're going to have a policy document. It's going to restrict the secrets uh, and, and the users and the applications what they have access to. Uh, so Vault does follow the practice of least privileges. Uh, no one has access to anything, uh, and you must be explicitly granted uh, access. And, and it's not just even a, a star access. You you have to specify, you know, whether you can list those secrets, whether you have uh, access to view them, whether you have access to create new ones. Um, so all those are have to be explicitly granted in a policy statement. Um, you can actually say that, you know, as far as where stars go or asterisks go, you can say, I have a particular path that uh, I want users to be able to get to, and they can actually get to all of these secrets in there. And policies are written in HashiCorp configuration language, HCL. So if you've used Terraform, it kind of follows that same, uh, that same field. So it's kind of a declarative language and you just pretty much specify what a policy is. So here's an example of a policy. This just allows a, a token to be able to look up its own, uh, you know, its own details like expire if it needs to be able to, um, you know, you need to look up your own token to see if, if you're getting close to uh, renewal, then time to renewal, you can do that. So, but this is kind of what the, uh, what it looks like. You specify a path. Uh, the method is, uh, authentication method is token and the self lookup so that it can get its own capabilities. And then there you say, yeah, it can read its own stuff. It can't change its, it, itself, but it can read what it's capable uh, of doing. So the path is um, is the policy. You know, if, if you've seen a recurring theme here, pretty much everything that is stored in Vault uh, is through that path. So you're going to have you know starting point is going to be your either authentication method or your secret is going to be that path that you created, and it can traverse on down there. We'll look here in a minute. There's actually uh, other ways of organizing things, but um, and then when you get into into um, Enterprise, there's actually uh, namespaces that you can uh, drill down into as well. Um, but that's all path-based. Most of the common capabilities are create, read, update, delete, and list. And like I said, KVs got a little bit a little bit different, but it's still, those are the common capabilities. Uh, and all of these are gonna respond to a post and a get. Um, the policy, so you can actually create paths. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you saw earlier when you create the AWS path, it just said AWS dash east. Well, you can actually create, you know, and say, I want the path to be AWS slash AWS dash east. And so then you can start putting all of your secrets engines, uh, you know, kind of organized that way. So um, this is actually going to show up in one of our, um, one of our labs a little bit later, uh, this uh, this LOB, but you're going to see, you know, you can actually say, okay, well, here's all the capabilities. I have this one particular team. They have this set of secrets for their development. I just need them to have access to all of them because, you know, that way, you know, they have what they need to do their development. They're not blocked. Um, so there's different ways that you can do this. Um, and it, it can be tightened down as much as you want. 
uh, or opened up as much as you need to. So uh, CLI commands, so you, uh, to, to create this, you can actually create policies right in the UI, um, or you can create a policy document and you can do a vault policy right and give it the, uh, give it the, the policy name as well as the policy file. And then you can associate that with, uh, with various authentication methods, um, secrets engines, things like that, that where policies are required. So quick review, um, Vault does not give access to anything by default. Um, you know, we've, I've said that several times, it's worth saying again, <laughs> by default it's, it's deny first. So, um, you know, common uh, HTTP verbs are uh, create, read, update, delete, and list. Um, and then being able to uh, write the policy to Vault, you can either do it on the CLI or the API. Um, you can also do it right there in the UI and uh, create it in the editor there. So finally getting to some exciting stuff here. Now we get to uh, the labs. So just a quick run through on the first one. And what we're going to do is there's not going to be a whole lot of additional lecturing in between these labs. We'll come back, do, do a little bit of review. It'll probably take five, 10 minutes in between just to cover what we're going to look at ahead. Um, but real quick, if again, if you haven't already done this, make sure you, uh, you create an instruct account because that's what we're going to use. Um, the, uh, we're going to do, we're going to have three separate, uh, labs that, that'll do and, and in each one of those, there's, uh, there's challenges in each one of those labs. Uh, and so you'll just kind of run through them all. Uh, and each one of them is going to take roughly about 20 minutes or so, and that's how much time we'll give you. And we'll probably extend one of those out just a little bit to, to give you a little extra time for a break. Um, so yeah, uh, the first one we're going to do is Vault Basics, um, and it's going to cover some of the CLI. So let's um, kind of looking through. And now all of these instructions are actually in Instruct over on the right-hand side, so you'll see it there. Um, but just to take a look at what we're doing with the first one, um, you're actually going to run a dev server. You're going to use the uh, Vault API, HTTP API. Um, I don't think I said that right, HTTP API. Um, and you're actually going to start this, uh, the track there. Um, the common theme here is you're going to look at the text over on the side. It's going to have you do a certain uh, number of things, like for instance, here, um, you know, you're going to uh, click start. You're going to pull up uh, instruct, you're going to pull up the track, it's going to load everything up, you hit start down at the bottom and check the box, and then of course it's going to keep going. So it's going to run you through the different challenges. And then we're going to run a vault prod server. Uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, KV engine. And again, these are the same exact instructions on every single one of these. So that's why I'm kind of running through these, you're not missing anything. Uh, we are going to use the user pass authentication method. Um, and then we will use the vault policies. So uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to, I'm actually going to put this in, I'm going to back up here uh, to this screen and I'm going to post the lab in the chat. Let me, didn't quite get to if you didn't quite get to the end of that, you're still working on it, feel free to, to continue on. We're going to have some uh, time here in the next labs to, uh, to catch up if you need to. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry for the, uh, the, the, the link confusion there. I was just checking to see if everyone was paying attention. <laughs> just kidding. No, so hopefully everybody got, got access to the track that we're looking for. So we're going to actually move on to the second of those tracks, and this is on dynamic database secrets. Um, let me get focus back on here so we can move along. Um, okay, so <clears throat> protecting databases, uh, the things that we've done in the past um, that, that we've done forever have, have been very difficult to maintain. Um, not only the process of getting, um, getting usernames and passwords can be difficult, um, it can be long. Database administrators um, don't <clears throat> really like having to create new users and all that kind of stuff all the time. Um, you know, what, what permissions are you granted? Uh, it becomes a, a big thing. And then, of course, 
how long are those staying around? Those, those usernames and passwords could be around for years. Uh, we run into this all the time where, where passwords aren't really rotated. It's the same database password that's been there for the last five years because we don't want to have to go and update, you know, 30 different configuration files. And it becomes um, kind of problematic on, on, all, on all sides. It's, it's a lot of work to maintain it. And it's also a higher security risk. So uh, Vault has several integ integ integrations of several databases to allow for Vault to manage the life cycle of creating uh, usernames and passwords and databases and uh, removing them once, once, the, uh, <clears throat> once their time to live has reached expiry. So um, you can create uh, you know, your select, uh, your, your create user and your, your grant statements for various databases. It doesn't have to be an RDBMS. It can be a, a NoSQL database. Uh, kind of each one of them has their own uh, way of supporting and writing those. So then you just let Vault manage everything. And, um, and it really makes everyone's life easier because not only the passwords, uh, you know, kind of dynamically rotated, you know, just with the whole idea of dynamic short-lived credentials, it's going to be a new username and password all the time. Database administrators, you know, they can write their, their grant statement once and give it to Vault, and then Vault can manage that role from there on. So they don't have to do all of their, uh, you know, double checking and making sure that they're uh, not giving away the farm when they create uh, credentials. So, uh, definitely one of the most popular uh, secrets engines in in Vault as far as moving forward into more modern uh, modern way of of dealing with secrets. Oops, there we go. Uh, so, like I said, there's there's quite a bit here. We've got our uh, all the ones that you've thought of. There's probably like 20, 25 different ones. So there's more that are uh, even beyond this list. But these are kind of the main ones, and you'll probably recognize. Um, most, if not all, of these. Uh, so, kind of the workflow is uh, you're going to create an instance of the, and this is kind of we're looking at uh, what our labs are. So, you're going to create an instance of the database of the uh, uh, secrets engine. Uh, you configure it with the plugin and the URL. Um, you're going to create some roles with uh, time to live as well as a SQL statement that. Uh, gives a permission, um, and then your applications and users uh, can actually request those credentials. Um, of course, it can be renewed up until the max TTL in which they need to re-authenticate. Um, so once again, Vault automatically uh, deletes the expired credentials and cleans up after itself. And um, if those credentials are compromised, uh, you can revoke them immediately. But it's, if you have to admit, it's a whole lot harder to compromise brand spanking new credentials if they're going to be rotated on a constant basis. Because a lot of times uh, what we see today is whenever you have breaches and uh, someone gets a, a huge list of data, whether it's usernames and passwords or uh, social security numbers or other, uh, you know, personal information, that stuff is not acted on immediately, at least not, not, not today. There might be a time where it is, but... Today, we're still within the window of, hey, it, it could be weeks or months before someone actually does something with it. So if someone does you know, get access to these things, uh, any one of these usernames and passwords, chances are it's probably not going to be around uh, by the time someone acts on it. So, uh, But again, if someone does, you can revoke them. So for the next two labs, the last two labs that we have today, um, we're going to use a MySQL database that runs uh, on the Vault server. Uh, and we're going to use a Python app that one of my colleagues wrote a couple of years ago to kind of demonstrate kind of the before and after of enabling the transit. So you can kind of see firsthand, you know, the, the, the changes that, um, that you can make and really get some immediate wins with uh, the transit engine um, by being able to encrypt data. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll go through this um, and outline some of this kind of like we did before. Um, so we're actually going to um, create the, this is kind of what we were looking at when I was talking about, hey, this is what you're going to do for the um, in, enabling the database. And this is exactly what you're going to look at today. So uh, we're going to be able to configure Vault um, with access to the MySQL database. What's nice here is that this gives you an understanding because a lot of times uh, you know, we're talking about how cool this, this feature is. 
it's kind of like, well, yeah, but how does that really work? How does Vault really uh, able to do this? Well, here's here's where it is. You're actually uh, set up the connection and give Vault some elevated credentials. Those credentials need to be specific for uh, for use only with Vault. So you don't want to give the actual root or SA credentials uh, to Vault, but you want to give some elevated credentials and then Vault will manage its own password. So as you can see here, the very last command, you're going to rotate the root and, um, and that way only Vault knows that password. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to, like I just said, we're going to rotate that, that root. This is kind of what you would look at if you were doing uh, you know, MySQL, you're going to grant all privileges on. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to create the user and grant privileges. Uh, we're going to then create a role. Um, and the role is actually where we give the SQL statement. Uh, we'll give it an initial TTL of one hour, but they can renew up to 24 hours. Um, and then we're going to issue the command and we're going to be able to see, look, check it out. We've got uh, a username and password. You can see that the username, and this is great for audit logging, things like that, where you can, uh, or auditing at least, where you can see where, uh, what role is attached to this particular user. If you need to, you know, see what's going on in your database, um, uh, you'll have access to the username there, and it will be able to, uh, to identify what, what capabilities it has within Vault. Uh, again, these are just some commands here that uh, that you can see where you can uh, renew, you can uh, revoke, and then you can look up and see how much longer uh, longer time you have. So, uh, looking at the next one again, this is um, uh, just the basic outline. The first thing we're going to do in the first challenge is enable the engine. Uh, second thing we're going to do is configure the database engine. Uh, we're going to generate some credentials. Uh, we're going to renew and revoke those credentials, and uh, and then we'll be pretty much done with that part. We'll be able to come back through and uh, set up for the next uh, the next lab, our next and our last lab. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go back over here. We're going to go ahead and get back into our breakout sessions. You can use that same link that I posted earlier, and I can repost it, but it does have the second one. So we're, so the last time we did the Vault Basics, this time we're going to do uh, Vault Dynamic Database Credentials, and there are about four challenges in there. So let me get back over to my Zoom screen, go back over to the chat. All right, well, I think we've got most people back. Welcome back. We've got just one final uh, chapter in lab to do. Um, so let's dive right on in. Um, so this is the encryption uh, as a service engine. There's a lot of things that it does around encryption, um, you know, around, you know, messages and things like that, signing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're just going to focus really on the encryption part of it today. Um, but definitely want to check out and see if, see if there's some other functions in there that um, if you look on our website, uh, there might be some things in there that, that could help you guys out internally at, at your work. So uh, moving on. So one of the things that is always problematic is, a, um, is encryption and encrypting data. A lot of times, you know, we hand that over to developers. I used to be a developer. And uh, it was always a problem because, you know, we were, I was working at Capital One, we were using Java uh, for our main application. There's a ton of different libraries out there. Um, and then, you know, you kind of, you know, we were told, yeah, you gotta, you gotta uh, make sure all the passwords are encrypted. We're not gonna let the sysadmins handle that anymore. So, uh, so we had to do it within the application and it really became a, a, a bit of a challenge because there's not very many programmers who really know how to use encryption libraries and, you know, really what, what style of encryption to use, things like that. That's really more up to the security. So without guidance, the, the first round of that was a, a bit of a disaster. You know, about half the teams got it right and half the teams had to redo it. But at least the second time around, we at least got some guidance. We kind of wisened up and, uh, and everything went through uh, pretty well at the time. The lesson to learn from that is that, you know, you, if we can have 
a, you know, the security team manage those keys for us and rotate those keys. And all, it, all a developer needs to do is say, hey, encrypt my, my payload and boom, we're done. Um, it makes everyone's life easier. It makes auditing easier. It makes sure that uh, you know our risk is reduced. And I, and so that's where we enter in, uh, you know, the Vault Transit engine uh, and encryption as a service. So rather than having developers manage their their libraries, update them, all that kind of stuff, just just let Vault do it. So developer, you know, security engineer creates the key, gives an endpoint to the uh, to the developer. The developer, you know, authenticates all the things that it needs to do. Then it just sends the payload over to Vault. Vault will encrypt it and send back the ciphertext, and then it can be stored, you know, in a in a blob and uh, object storage, uh, whatever it is that that works best for your organization. Uh, so uh, again, some of these benefits: it's well architected encryption as a service API, uh, so no one has to really understand cryptography. Um, it does provide centralized key management, so Vault does. Uh, hang on to those keys and you can see what keys are done, when were they last rotated, all that kind of stuff. You can keep all that right there from an administrator standpoint. And again, leaving that up to developers, um, not really in their wheelhouse. It's not something that they, they'd rather be coding rather than managing keys. So this puts everybody's part here in the right place. Uh, sure, as only, you know, only the right algorithms are being used. They're not using something that's outdated with an outdated library. Um, you can actually rotate and rewrap if you're changing keys. Um, and, you know, here's the, here's the real benefit. And um, I'm going to stress this, that a lot of times, you know, you have like, say, AWS, you've got S3, you've got that encrypted at rest, you've got your databases, you've got data encrypted at rest. This day and age, when we talked about this earlier, this day and age, that doesn't really help us in real day-to-day -day stuff. It's a check that needs to, you know, a box that needs to be checked and should someone actually break into a data center, they're not gonna get your data. But that's a, the reality of that happening is, is next to nothing. Really what people do these days is they, they use credentials, they steal credentials, they use other ways of getting into your data. Um, and that's why we still have breaches is because it's, you know, somebody gets a username, password, logs into a database and just, you know, sucks all the data out. Well, you know what, if that data was encrypted in the field rather than just at rest, they would just get garbage. And that's really, they would just get ciphertext. That's the, you know, as far as they're concerned, they don't have access to the key or the data to be able to unwrap it. So if we're really, uh, you know, bent on, on securing our customers' data and keeping their data safe, we want to keep it encrypted in files and in databases and things like that. So um, that's what we're going to take a look at today. What are we looking at? You know, there's certain people, you know, you kind of, when you look at this application, you're going to see that there's a view that maybe an, uh, you know, maybe somebody from the HR department is able to look at social security numbers and birthdays. Um, but we don't want developers being able to see that in the database. Um, you know, the, the right people have the right access type of things. So, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run this application just bare bones without encryption enabled. Um, and then we're going to start enabling some features uh, as you go throughout the lab to be able to see the difference as you move along. Um, so there's not going to be any coding or anything on, on your part. It's really just kind of changing, uh, changing flags in a configuration file. Um, so that's what we're going to do. This is kind of a, a screenshot of the application here. Um, there's two main views. There's the records view. Um, and that's what, like I said, that's maybe somebody in HR or a manager or somebody can actually look at this data. Um, here it is, the application view. Um, so you're able to look at that stuff. Um, but again, we don't want the, we don't want the developers to, to see that kind of stuff or maybe, you know, even database administrators, we want to keep that stuff hidden. Um, this is kind of where you can add more stuff to it, add another user. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at everything plain Jane without the encryption. Next, we're going to look at it with encryption. And we're actually even going to use database dynamic database credentials. We're going to rotate the keys. Uh, and so the steps we're going to take in the next lab are we're going to enable the transit engine. We're going to create an encryption key. Uh, next, we are going to use the app without Vault. Then we're going to enable Vault and start using dynamic credentials as well as uh, encrypting our data at rest. And uh, then we're going to come back and do a, a quick review. 
and we will have a Q&A afterward. So let me get back over here. Uh, and so this is where we're at. Um, and we can go ahead and take another 20 minutes to finish up here. And I think we'll be good to go. I think it's worth it. Perfect. Um, so yeah, the just a couple more slides here, quick review. Uh, of course, the transit engine, the, the whole idea here is developers can, can deal with encryption without having to be experts in cryptography. That's the real takeaway here. And everyone's happy. Everyone gets time back. It's, uh, it's really, uh, really nice. So, um, you know, the vault does not actually store the encrypted data. It just sends back the ciphertext. So, you know, whoever's getting back that ciphertext will store it wherever they need to. Uh, you can rotate the key and you can re-encrypt. It's called re-wrapping you know, older records that you need to. And you can tell by, if you need to take a look and see what version, you can actually look at the raw data wherever you stored it. And you'll see that it says vault dash and then the, or vault colon, and then the, the version will be indicated there. Um, so those are the, the big takeaways there. But, you know, uh, other than that, I want to say thank you so much for participating today. Um, Hopefully you're following along in this in this deck and you can actually click on some of these things to kind of learn more about what we're doing here. Um, but we appreciate your time and I think that's all I have. There is a feedback link, but it's not the right one. Uh, I'd rather have Kelly send that one out than the one that I have. So I'll stop sharing. Uh, and once again, thanks everyone for attending and I hope you got something out of this today. And back to you, Kelly.